to order as well as to uh, following this meeting reconvene in executive session. Motion to um, open uh, this uh, meeting and reconvene later in executive session. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Um, we have a couple adjustments to the agenda for tonight. We have two additional topics, um, the review of the capital plan, as well as articles uh, for special town meeting that's set for Saturday, October 17th at Hopkins. Uh, we'll add those two adjustments to the agenda to presentations and discussion items, which uh, occur before the second public comment. Um, I also had one announcement that I wanted to make regarding um, our intention to, uh, excuse me, there's a gnat flying around here. Um, we recognize that these public comments have been, um, as we've referred to the policy, uh, not an opportunity for Q&A, um, that they have been really your opportunity to make public comment when we're thrilled to see uh, the number of participants that we have. But we also recognize that um, we do need an opportunity for Q&A. So I'm, I'm happy to announce that one of the things that we plan on scheduling um, as soon as we conclude our negotiations with um, the HEA is to announce uh, Q&A sessions that would be scheduled for the community as an opportunity to um, ask the specific questions about um, the start of the school year, uh, specific questions about buildings, about um, potential grades, about um, just the schedule, anything that may be uh, unclear and um, you're not sure about, we would welcome that dialogue in a public forum uh, Q&A mechanism. So we're looking forward to those. As soon as we are able to uh, announce those, we will likely have multiple Q&A sessions for each of the um, elementary school and for Hopkins so that uh, it's not just one date in case you, folks are unavailable. So uh, we look forward to announcing those once we have finished our um, negotiations and discussions with the HEA and look forward to holding those with, with everyone. All right, uh, with that, we're gonna move into public comment. This is the first of two. So this uh, public comment again precedes the discussion around uh, the remote plans uh, for each of the buildings as well as the two other adjustment um, added topics I just indicated. We've discussed the process for public comment previously. As a reminder, um, while we do not cap the total time for public comment, we will limit individual speakers to three minutes. Um, and there are other protocol that are laid out in the policy statement around public comment. If you do wish to make a public comment, please uh, feel free to raise your digital hand, or if you are on the phone, just come off of mute um, and indicate that you'd like to make public comment. Uh, so if anyone would like to make public comment at this time, uh, please go ahead and uh, signal that through the Zoom tool. Okay, seeing none at this time, uh, we will then move into our first uh, discussion topic, uh, which is the remote learning plan. Uh, we'll begin with um, Hopkins Academy and then move to the elementary school. Uh, for I'm those sorry, I, I apologize, Heather. I think you're on the wrong note. The first one is um, the uh, approval, just discussion of the approval of the plan in general. I'm sorry, I think you might be referencing the Tuesday. You might be looking at the Tuesday. Am I off here? I oh, know. no, the, those were what was listed. Yeah, but, um, sorry, sorry. So the approval, yeah, so the approval, the approval of the plan, we can go to that. That's fine. That's first. Um, so by approving the plan, um, the school committee has determined that this plan does demonstrate um, an understanding of effective mitigation and risk reduction uh, when reopening schools. Uh, and so that would be um, the plan that we're discussing is in terms of remote learning uh, and that that plan provides instructional plans for students in the event that learning is uh, delivered in an in-person hybrid or remote model. The plans as we've discussed will continue to be revised as we implement, adjust and improve our practices based on what we learn from experience uh, and we'll continue to incorporate new information, data, guidance as it becomes available. 
So um, the district cap, the district plan that we have um, that has been uh, in continuing to be built upon and transparent to the public as it's been assembled uh, has been out there. And from that, that links into the different remote learning plans that we have for each of the, uh, the buildings. So Annie, with that, can I turn that over then to you and the administration to cover? Yes, of course. So I just want to underscore as you did, and let me clarify on, on Tuesday, both of the principals reviewed the um, substantive changes and revisions that have been made with input from faculty to remote learning plans. Um, so those were uh, presented on Tuesday. There was some discussion about that on Tuesday and they are embedded within the entire plan. I want to uh, reinforce what Heather just said, that by approving the plan, the school committee again is, is acknowledging or determining that the plan demonstrates an understanding of effective mitigation strategies, strategies when reducing the risk associated with reopening schools. And that the plan also provides it's sufficient options to be able to address the most likely scenarios that we would encounter in the upcoming year. This plan is not, it is, even though we're approving it, we will constantly build upon the plan. One thing is uh, we take input from our faculty, our staff, our parents and students very seriously, right? So we take input from them very seriously. And as we, gather additional input, we will make revisions to the plan. As additional data, information, and guidance become available, we will revise this plan as needed. And as we learn things through implementation, we will improve upon this plan, not only from our own experience with implementation, but from the feedback that families and students, faculty and staff give the administration, provide to the school committee, um, we will keep making changes to it. So I just think it's important that people understand that we want this very much to be a living document that demonstrates our desire to really be responsible, but equally our desire to be responsive. So the goal isn't to um, put a period on the sentence and say, we're all done here. Um, we constantly will be improving upon it, but we do need to submit to the department um, our overall plan. And um, so the school committee would need to vote that. And, um, and then of course, we can revisit the decision of regarding the start of, um, not revisit that decision, but remind people the decision of starting school as well. Okay, so um, as part of voting for the remote plan that needs to be uh, provided to the district, we. We referenced this uh, in our meeting on Tuesday earlier this week that we were discussing around um, special selected populations who would be uh, offered face to face access access to in person instruction. I do want to recap that at this time as um, the school committee in coordination with the administration um, has determined as part of this plan that um, the selected populations who most particularly need the face-to-face -face services and are being offered the opportunity uh, for access to in-person instruction include students with disabilities, English language learners, economically disadvantaged, um, qualifying or homeless, uh, other categories such as that in terms of homelessness, foster care, as well as pre-K. Um, Annie, did I miss anything on those categories? Uh, no, I think that, let me make sure. I think um, really what's important within that is those categories uh, speak to um, those students who are disproportionately adversely affected. And many um, of those recommendations are laid out in DESE guidance. Great. Are there any questions from the committee on the remote learning plans for either um, Hopkins Academy or Hadley Elementary School uh, before we vote on approving those plans for moving forward. Hey, this is Paul. Just to first off to say thanks for all the hard work to these plans. Just so I'm clear and others are clear. So a week, two weeks ago, I forget now, we, there was the school committee decision to um, 
delay full in-person um, cohort in, for the first six weeks, at least the first six weeks of school. That's, uh, that's part of this plan, but that's not the decision in front of us tonight. That decision has been made tonight. We're really looking at the overarching plan that includes a remote learning plan for both schools. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a state requirement that we respond by tomorrow, I believe it is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that yes. approval then, and as it's included in these special populations categories of who's gonna be allowed to start in-person learning September 14th. Correct. And then Correct. there's a subsequent conversation, and I don't believe we're necessarily gonna to get to that tonight, but there's a subsequent conversation that where the school committee is gonna chat about what are those criteria by which we will determine uh, when we might move from one phase to the next. Yes, so what currently exists in the, exists in the plan um, is that at a minimum, um, and I think it's important because, uh, I, Heather, please jump in, but I think this could be confusing for people um, who may think, well, if, if those criteria are already present, then um, why the delay in full in-person learning for all students? And again, I would invite anyone in the school committee to uh, correct me in terms of talking through the school committee's deliberation and vote, but um, we, we have a very layered what's called mitigation strategies. So throughout the plan, you see the emphasis that we place on physical distancing. While DESE allowed for distances of one meter apart, our plan focused in in-person learning on having students six feet apart. We paid very close attention to group distancing. So we cohorted students. We reduced the number of meals that we would serve at the beginning of the school year and had lunch become grab and go. So we worked very hard to make sure our hygiene protocols, cleaning protocols, mask policies for all students, um, for all faculty. Um, of course, we understand that disability impact and medical exemptions, that um, we would absolutely um, respect that, but as a policy, focusing on hygiene, mask wearing, physical distancing, cohorts, um, these are all part of our plan. In addition to that, the school committee talked about, and several members of the audience talked about these two very, these two unknowns. Um, and the two unknowns that came up were, how can we be certain of the effectiveness of these mitigation strategies. The mitigation strategies that we put in the plan are evidence-based, right? So we, we reviewed not only guidance from DPH, but guidance from the Harvard School of Public Health. We spent a lot of time looking at recommendations about how to reduce risk. We can't eliminate risk, but how to reduce it. We looked at how to make the building uh, environmentally safer and healthier. And we, we have all of that in the plan, but at the end of the day, the plan works when everybody recognizes that it is a shared responsibility, right? That our faculty and staff and the administration have to do their part, students have to do their part, families have to do their part. When children are sick, they have to stay home. And so nobody can answer with absolute certainty, will this work? Because it's going to require all of us to do our part. So there's an unknown. I certainly believe, I trust, I hope that everyone is equally invested in keeping the community safe and that people will do their part, everybody. The other big unknown is what will reopening schools do in general to community transmission rates? And what I heard the school committee say is in light of these two big unknowns, we're gonna add an additional mitigation strategy of reducing the number of student bodies in the building in the first few weeks, the first six weeks of school. Not for the year, not for um, in this, but in the first six weeks, we're adding this additional mitigation strategy. Um, and then we'll pay very close attention to what does happen to community transmission when school buildings reopen. The school committee has also recognized, again, that there are populations of students who are disproportionately adversely affected by a lack of access to in-person learning. And so that is why the majority of students are learning remotely and a very small 
much smaller group of students um, would be uh, receiving in-person services at the start of the school year. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that covers, I just wanted to clarify that. And again, if school committee has anything else to add with that, but I just wanted to clarify that perhaps for the community and for people who are listening about what's included in the plan and this uh, kind of additional measure that the school committee has uh, recommended for the first six weeks of school in a desire to um, keep the community at safer. Yeah, I'll just add two things, Annie. Um, one is folks may be thinking, okay, now how do we move into after the six weeks and the examination of moving into the next phase? So we've, we've committed to meeting essentially every two weeks, um, which will wind up being the second and the last um, Monday of each month, reviewing that community and school transmission data. And um, really, and this was as part of our motion when we voted on, on this, that uh, we would be examining the public health metrics and uh, ensuring that those public health metrics are what we utilize to determine um, as a committee uh, moving forward into, into the next phase. And so we are uh, committed to doing that and continuing to um, examine those metrics to be sure that we are transparent in that process as well as communicating with the public about um, where we see ourselves headed. And I'm sorry, Heather, and also Paul, you would I lost that. On the metrics, the metrics that are in the plan currently have to do with um, if we saw obviously a county or statewide positivity rate of five uh, percent higher than greater than five percent. Uh, that you've seen everywhere at John Hopkins University tracks that for the whole nation. That signals that there's an issue with community transmission, either locally or statewide. We certainly um, in moving from one phase to another phase. We'll um, pay close attention to the weekly, the dashboard that DPH publishes. And now that DPH has set up red, green, yellow, and unshaded in terms of zones. We also had a question out to DPH um, because we recognize, and again, I'm gonna say this, the school committee's recommendation to begin the school year um, with the majority of students learning remotely was not in response to those metrics not being being too high. It was an additional mitigation strategy because they're still, regardless of metrics, there are these still two unknowns. So the metrics, um, we'll look at the positivity rate. We will look at the table, um, which has the red, yellow, green that was recently published. It's linked in the plan on the introduction, in the introduction section, you can link directly to that table. Um, and, or whether a community is unshaded, smaller communities don't get red, green, or yellow, they become, they're unshaded. County data is now included in that table. It wasn't previously, but actually Hadley Public Schools asked DPH to start including county da uh, data in that table. And um, we're very interested in percent change. So if now we're at, um, below 2% uh, countywide of uh, percent positivity, um, is, it, is it absolutely above 5% or would there be a percent change that um, DPH would deem concerning? We've asked the Department of Public Health this question and the, actually the chief person responsible for that table that's linked in our plan and that's available on DPH's website. That epidemiologist has indicated to me that that conversation has, um, that that is a conversation that's the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the chief epidemiologist will be having to determine uh, percent change that we should pay attention to. So there are metrics that currently exist in the plan and also school transmission rates. We would have no data on that now School transmission rates are not absolute case count. It's evidence of school transmission. So we would look at community transmission as measured by uh, testing positivity rates, case counts in smaller communities, and percent changes in those things. And we would look at school transmission data. And those are the data that we would use to determine movement into a, a subsequent phase, extension of an existing phase, or hopefully this doesn't happen, the need to go back to a previous phase. 
that's, that's articulated in the plan that's in front of us tonight. Uh, the, the, what is not in that plan is the percent, what the percent change would be because DPH has not answered that question at this point. Um, what is articulated in the plan is um, uh, that um, we would examine percent positivity and that below 5% is indicative that um, it's kind of, that's what gets the green typically on percent positivity. But again, I'm gonna go back, DPH hasn't answered that question for us about percent change. So when is percent, if you start very low, if, if you go to 5% in four weeks, that's a huge problem, right? Sure. So- Are we revisiting, do we, can you remind me, do we have a school committee meeting on Monday? You have one on 824. Um, you've reserved 817, Monday 817 for executive session if it's needed for collective bargaining. You have a school committee scheduled for August 24th, for August 31st, um, and then we'll schedule um, at least two in September. We will I, really would like, I mean, I, I support this plan, the development plan, and I, mm -hmm. I think, and I, I appreciate the conversation um, to get us here and all the hard work. I would like as much clarity as we can as to when we can move into the phase. I agree with Heather that, you know, let's revisit it every two weeks. But if there is sort of ambiguity in there, I, I, I just fear that we're gonna have a similar argument, you know, two months from now. And is there a way where we can say, this is what we're gonna abide by. So I think the big thing is that parents can plan. They'll mm -hmm. know, hey, we're, we're, we're four weeks into our six weeks and it looks like we're gonna be opening back up because the metrics say so, as opposed to four weeks in the school committee still uncertain. I want to really kind of provide that clarity now and agree to specific metrics. And I'm not sure what you just described as specific enough, because I'm worried that four weeks in, parents are not sure what the school committee is going to decide. And that's going to be really difficult for people to plan. So we, uh, if, is this, this is for school committee discussion and del deliberation, but would this be the degree of specificity you're looking for um, that at these meetings, the school committee would review community and school transmission data. And if uh, Hadley remained in an unshaded zone, um, that the county itself also still remained in green, and that we did not have evidence of school transmission data, which again is not absolute, it's not synonymous with absolute case count. It's evidence of transmission. Um, that the district would move into in-person cohort model and six weeks would be no later than October 26th. So yeah, that's specific. It would move and no later and, and it's at school committee discretion, you know, do we want to move earlier? That seems less likely, but I would, you know, as Heather said, maybe we, won't, we want to revisit and make go, no go decisions. Of course, we'd give parents heads up. When you talk about school evidence of school transmission, is it a single case of evidence school transmission? Transmission wouldn't be a single case, no. So evidence of school transmission, I use this example all the time. You can have case count without having school transmission. So you could have students who went to a, uh, an event together and at that event, um, they were exposed, but we don't see any school spread. So no, nobody else at the school, it doesn't spread. There isn't transmission at the school. Well, and I mean. in my conversation, so then in that, what, what that could indicate is that the mitigation strategies that we have in place, which is mask wearing, except for medical uh, exemptions, that mask wearing for all students and staff, hand hygiene, physical distancing and group distancing and regular and frequent cleaning and disinfecting are having its intended effect, right? So um, that's that distinction. And in terms of how do you know when that's happening, that is, so when we know of a case, our school nurses work with um, our board of health and we've actually have somebody in line who's a registered nurse to support to also help us with contact tracing when that's needed. They work with the contact tracing collaborative, they work together, they contact trace. They, then they use their clinical judgment in collaboration with our board of health, with our consulting physician, school physician, um, with DPH if necessary and the contact tracing collaborative to make a clinical judgment about if school transmission if we have an issue with school transmission. 
So sorry, that one isn't as if you have X. Now again, this is, this is uh, something to be presented to the school committee as, you know, is that the degree of specificity um, that makes sense to the school committee? The school committee can also recommend a different approach to these metrics. Absolutely. I mean, and we can adjust that. Yeah. This approach makes sense to me, Paul. I mean, at least what Annie's outlined, but I agree with you that if what we need to do at our next meeting, maybe on the 24th, is lay out in writing, these are the, this is what we're using, the source that we're using, the criteria, the flagging criteria that we're using, and the, the commitment to review those on this um, regular basis. I think that'd be great, Heather. It's a good idea. And I think what you laid out, Annie, makes sense to me. I know that I think that Tara also, but again, the point of dedicating, so you can certainly um, approve with that, you know, with the understanding that this will be submitted to the state and that on the 24th, these uh, uh, metrics may be revised in the plan. Um, hopefully DPH will have responded to us by then about percent change. And I also know that um, I believe that Tara had had some, um, had some very um, interesting and good ideas about um, about approaching those metrics. So I think um, if I can, I, I want it to be more specific as well, but I wanna make sure that we're not locking us into a specificity that's not using um, the most appropriate guidance mm -hmm. and that's not the safest approach. And right now I'm concerned, as Annie had mentioned, um, she'd reached out to DPH and we're still waiting to hear. And I would like to see a multifactorial approach and I would like it to include school transmission data. I think that's great, but I would like it to include, and I'm not sure if, if you know, there, there's a lot of metrics that are starting to come out and, and they are just over the past few days, there's a lot of districts that are starting to come out with metrics. And I think that in the next few weeks, we're gonna have a lot more information that can help mm -hmm. guide our response. So my concern is locking us into something right mm -hmm. now in our plan and having trouble revising it. So if we use some sort of language when we submit, um, you know, that there is going to be additional um, yeah. layers in place um, mm -hmm. once we have further guidance, once we're provided mm -hmm. with that, because I just don't want to lock us in. And I would like us to have a, a multifactorial approach where we look at, um, for instance, and again, it's not specific because we don't have that data right now, that, you know, the um, school, uh, that the um, testing positivity is less than X percent, um, and the rate of change um, in testing positivity is less than X percent over X number of weeks, um, in addition to looking at school transmission data. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of different things that we're able to look at that kind of allows us to um, ensure that we have the safest moving from phases to one another and that it's also very um, transparent. So as we're going from meeting to meeting, I agree, it needs to be very clear and there's no ambiguity and we come up with that. I'm just concerned about locking us into that right now at this meeting when we're still kind of waiting for information available. Yeah. I think what the plan does, but I mute myself again, no, I didn't. I think what, I think what the plan does is underscore the fact that this is important to this school committee. So we, we don't want this decision to be a subjective decision. So what the plan does, and, and it, our, our approach was one of the first in the Commonwealth to bring up this idea of phases and, and criteria that, that we would use to move from one phase to another. To your point, we want those, to your point, Tara, we want those to be um, sound, we want them to be transparent. What the plan is saying now is that that is really important to us. And at a minimum, right? So some of those things are at a minimum, right? The John Hopkins University dashboard. And that's important that we include whatever we decide in a link in a place where people, we want people to watch school committee and engage with us, but they don't have to. They could just click on it and make sure they could watch themselves. Um, so right now we have what's almost like just a mi the minimum, right? Is that we know that if testing positivity shows statewide that we're in the red or countywide that we're in the red, that's, that's a problem. And um, that evidence of school transmission would be a problem. But now, as you said, we keep getting additional information and we want these criteria and these metrics to be as sound and meaningful as possible so that we're making the right decisions. 
So we can absolutely, I can, I can call that out in the submission to the department, but that's why I go back to this plan is constantly going to be revised and not revised in big ways of, oh, we just came up with a crazy idea and we feel like trying it out, but revised in, in improving it and refining it in order to uh, keep things to, to do what we need to do um, to reduce risk. And to be clear, just for Paul, I don't, the way that I see it is not um, something that we're saying that we're going to be able to change those metrics all the time. I just want to make sure that we're giving us the time, um, say if we meet on the 24th, hopefully we have more time to research and have more information available and guidance available to us, because I don't think it's something where any of us would want to keep changing our metrics, um, mm -hmm. unless metrics were advised to be changed. Like if there was some statewide information that was available that the governor said, fine. But I don't think the intention behind that would be to constantly change our metrics so that it's an unknown to parents, but it's to ensure that the metrics that we put into place are the best metrics that we can have for our school safety and um, that we feel confident in what we're using for data so that it's not constantly a question for us so that we know we look at it and our meetings are efficient as they come up you know, two times a month, it's very clear to us and we can make clear and easy decisions about what to do. Yeah, and I think to Annie's point, I mean, the decisions that we arrive at should be able to be replicated by anybody else who has access to that same data. And that's, I mean, that's where I think if we can start that out, um, that conversation out on August 24th, and if, you know, if we do need more time to go through and make sure we've captured everything, we have a subsequent meeting on the 31st, but I agree, I'd like to get this nailed down so that we're being very clear about these are the things we're looking at as we examine moving from one phase into the next. And this is something that we don't have to have locked down, I think, Annie, if I'm correct, by submitting for tomorrow, submitting our plan, but we're able to readjust and look at these metrics at a later date, and that's not a problem with our submission for tomorrow. No, it isn't. I mean, again, to your point, the, the governor's office could, could change requirements if something happened statewide, right? So that's where, again, we wouldn't change just to change. We want it as clear and so people can plan as much as possible. But there, yes, we can submit yeah, because yeah. things can change based on uh, guidance and for a host of other reasons. Right, so if the state moves back to phase one, then uh, you know, our plan doesn't really matter with that in terms of what metrics we're using. We're under that state guidance. Right. 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 Um, yes. I had questions about the um, remote plans given our sure. information yep. regarding special populations. I didn't know if we were going to go over the remote plans sure. again or if sure. we're just going to ask questions. I, well, we certainly can. We haven't made substantive changes since Tuesday. So there was the presentation on Tuesday, and I'm sorry for that confusion. But certainly if there are specific questions that, that folks have or things that remain unclear, we're, we're happy to respond to those. Um, so I, I do have a couple specific questions. So given um, that we are looking to have a certain population of students um, in school the first six weeks, I guess, mm -hmm. statements and questions. So mm -hmm. that population, to be clear um, to um, parents, is that that population would still follow the phased in approach schedule, but but not not phasing in as adding in full days as in those first six weeks would still be um, for the elementary school 825 to one o'clock. So it would yes. still be that half day, no lunch. And then Thank one you for that clarification. Yes, that is that phase one in person cohort model is what students would be doing if they were accessing in-person services in the first six weeks. They the would not then move into a phase two while everybody else is in a phase one. They would just continue with that while other students return. Yes, thank you. And that allows for um, the same schedule for remote learners and in-person learners, right? And that was my other question, because I and I may be recalling it incorrectly and it may have been changed, but when it comes to AGS, I thought that the schedules were different when they were um, 
mostly remote. So those first six weeks remote for most. I thought that that schedule looked a little bit different than when we start the in-person cohort. I thought I recall that um, specials would be embedded in their normal times when we were remote, but then when we moved to that first phase of in-person, they would be in the afternoon. So no, I, I apologize for the confusion on that because there's also this piece of, albeit I certainly hope that we don't find ourselves here again, but um, this idea of 100% remote, that equals the spring, right? Nobody can set foot in a building, right? Nobody sets foot in a building. 100% of students are remote. Well, what, what I don't feel like I was very clear about. So if any students are accessing the building for in-person services, it is, it is no longer 100% remote, right? And then to allow for that, um, integration of learning experiences between students who are present and students who aren't present, then um, you, we want to make sure that those schedules, it's also less disruptive when additional students come back in, we've all been on the same schedule, right? There's not a schedule shift that's happening. Mm -hmm. So it will be the same, just to be clear. Um, it Correct. will be the same for kids who are that special population in school versus Correct. the kids who are learning Correct. remotely will be on the yes. same learning schedule. Yes, and thank you for asking that question because that was not clear. I appreciate that. Do you have other questions, Tara? Are you good, oh, Tara? I think I'm good right now. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I didn't have I didn't have any specific questions or need to go through the plan in its, in its entirety again. Others? Uh, I had, a, and I apologize if this is something that was brought up in the meeting on today. Um, hey, Jack. But, hi. Uh, <laughs> looking through the remote plan again, um, I see there's a section on extracurriculars, um, and I'm wondering if stuff, if, if uh, classes like band and chorus, things that don't really translate well to remote learning fall under that category of essentially it's still being worked on. I was wondering if there's any more concrete plans for how to um, deliver that experience remotely at this point. I think April, uh, excuse me, I think Ms. Camuso can speak to, um, she's, she's done a lot of work with the advisors about how they can uh, set up extracurricular activities remotely, so I'll let her speak to that. I will say that even, even extracurriculars, so band is also an extracurricular activity, in addition to being a class, band is an extracurricular activity, that as long as the safety guidelines established by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are followed, which will make things challenging but not impossible. Right, and then I will uh, let Ms. Camusa speak in more detail to how extracurriculars will be managed. Sure, I know the question is, is a little bit more too about banding course during the school day. Uh, and I do have a meeting tomorrow morning with Mr. Fazio, but any class, PE as well, are all of those courses have been doing a lot of work around how their courses are going to translate when they are remote. But again, our intention is always to return to in-person so we're not scrapping a whole course for the year, right? They're just gonna be working on different plans for how things look when they're remote. So that might include more time around music theory during those remote times, but it also might include individual practice uh, and submissions of recordings by students in order to have Mr. Fazio review those. It could involve synchronous time, all of those types of plans. So what you're talking about is the curriculum and the lessons. That's what teachers will be working on starting August 27th. So any work that they're doing on that right now is kind of above and beyond. And believe me, they are. They're thinking about that and they're working on those, but they haven't had to submit any of that yet. Uh, those unit outlines and those lessons will be looked at during those opening PD days. In terms of the extracurriculars, uh, people who are interested in continuing to advise those are submitting a plan to me that includes a full remote plan and an in-person plan following the guidance. And as Dr. McKenzie said, there is specific guidance for all of those different areas, uh, even for drama to follow. So they're submitting all of those plans, assuming that those positions get posted, right? Each of those people will have a, a plan that would be approved and then they could run their extracurricular depending on you know, whichever plan or wherever kids are at that time um, so that they can all participate. So it doesn't really answer your question. I don't have a concrete, this is exactly what band is gonna look like. Uh, just like I don't have a concrete, this is exactly what 
English 10 is going to look like. Those plans are going to be developed at the beginning, and that's why the MTA requested the delay in the school year and the extra time for teachers to work on that at that time. That That's pretty much the answer I was expecting. Because um, at this point, I know that there's a lot still being figured out. Um, I would say if you have ideas, you should definitely share those ideas <laughs> with any of the people uh, that you're thinking of. I'm sure they would always appreciate that. And I can say, under the cohort for in-person, I've done some different planning around which students in which grade levels would be with different teachers. And there were some requests made to have uh, yourself and a couple others with Mr. Fazio, so that if you're stuck in a room with someone all day, it's someone that you could perhaps help with band and chorus uh, in the elementary school as well. So we are thinking intentionally about who we are cohorting with what teachers. That, that was gonna be another question at some point, so thank you for answering that. Um, do you think that there will be because I know, because like you said, in the next couple of weeks, that's going to be when the more concrete plans are going to be going into place. Um, will the students get to know um, some, like, more about their, their individual classes and how their experiences with them are going to be shifting before the school year starts? Like, will those plans, if they're approved from individual teachers, be put online or maybe an outline of them? Or So if you're talking about the classroom, you're going to see the outline... Uh, in the Google Classroom, so teachers will have outlines for their units, and they'll have, um, you know, their content and their assessments or whatever else in the Google Classroom. When you see that will probably really vary with the teacher. For example, I think some students told me that Ms. Ward already invited them to her Google Classroom, so she, she's a little bit ahead. Uh, they all have a final, you know, due date just like anybody, um, so there's, there's not a guarantee that you're going to see that two weeks early. It'll probably just depend on the specific teacher. In terms of the extracurriculars, Dr. McKenzie and I have not discussed yet at what point we're gonna post for the stipend positions and which ones. Some of it also depends on the actual item, right? So we're still waiting to hear about athletics. Uh, I know Ms. Lynch is looking into mock trial, but they haven't made any decisions yet um, whether or not that's gonna run. So some of it's a little bit out of our hands, but as soon as, as soon as we can know, we will certainly share it. And I would keep an eye out for invitations to Google Classroom, because as you know, some people like to get things done early, and then you would see some of that in there ahead of time. Thank you. And just to follow up, Jack, I know you're far removed from your days at Hadley Elementary School, but <laughs> I would like to highlight that we will be working with our staff starting August 27th to have our class list will be finalized. We're naturally cohorted, so you have your classroom teacher. And those classroom teachers will be hopefully reaching out to families and letting them know where the links are and where they need to go for information on their specific day, what the student's day will look like. Thanks, Jack. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, um, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the um, district reopening remote learning plan? I moved uh, the, I'm sorry, the entire plan. Is it the, entire. Yeah, the district reopening, fall reopening plan. Sorry. Thank you, sorry. Is, the, is there a motion to approve the district fall reopening plan? Thank you. Can we, can we add something yep. to it? Um, can we add something along the lines of with the understanding that this is a living document and changes may be made to improve the plan as more data and guidance are available? Is that possible? Just to make it clear? It is a living plan. I would welcome that. Great idea. Will Desi uh, reject that? No, they won't. I just want to make sure I... I in typing it correctly, a motion to approve the district fall reopening plan with the understanding that this is a living document and changes may be made to improve the plan. Yep, to improve the plan as more data and guidance is available. Or as data and guidance is available. Uh, okay. Perfect. I got that. So that with the uh, Humera Excuse me, uh, Humira Fasahuddin uh, amended motion? Is that who made that? I, I motion to approve that with the amendment. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. 
All right, we're going to move to the remaining two um, agenda items as part of the presentation and discussion before we go into public comment. Uh, the review of the capital plan. Yes. Um, so the school committee um, capital plan is, I'm looking to share my screen. I apologize again for that. Let me just get this up and then let me just share this for people. Um, there's not significant changes to this. Uh, the biggest change, now I can share it. Um, so the biggest change is that uh, renovations, particularly um, locker room and unit ventilators. So let me be clear when I say this about the unit ventilators. What we're doing right now with the unit ventilation system in both buildings is making sure that every single unit ventilator in every building has been inspected, has been repaired, and um, this is in the process what's happening now, and is being cleaned and disinfected. And that also involves changing of filters and a number of other things. This capital item refers to a complete replacement, right, of the unit ventilation system at Hopkins Academy. We had previously submitted uh, last year, meaning a year, May 2019, we submitted our first M Mass School Building Authority request for funding for these two projects, locker room re renovations and unit ventilator replacement. And um, we did not receive Mass School Building Authority funding. We have since resubmitted that and we expect that um, we will have an answer by December. And so we've simply shifted those to FY22. We're waiting to hear from Mass School Building Authority, but I wanna make sure that the public is clear that the inspection, repair, cleaning and disinfecting is happening now. That is that's repair and not replacement. The capital item is about a massive renovation and replacement. Um, the um, technology upgrades are, um, we actually, when we say capital plan, this doesn't mean these are all things we're asking the town for. So if you recall, town isn't funding that. Um, we uh, are self-funding that and the remaining items that was really the only significant change. We had to review this tonight because we're giving it to the town. And I wanted to check with the school committee tonight. So if they're comfortable with moving those two items to fiscal year 22, uh, with the understanding that we are waiting to hear from Mass School Building Authority, um, then it is my understanding that the school committee does not have any articles for the special town meeting warrant. So I also wanted to verify that with folks that people weren't thinking that there was some major capital item we were bringing to special town meeting on October 17th. Hey Annie, this is Paul. So the mm -hmm. tech upgrades at 27 and a half thousand, we are not asking the town for that money. No, yeah. No. So yeah, I fully support moving over what the Unit event replacement and the girls locker room remodel had been in for this year. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is not a great year to be asking for $1.6 million. So I appreciate moving them. Um, I'll say two things just that are highlights. Uh, one is I believe today the air purifiers were ordered. So they should be on their way soon for all the classrooms. So that's a, there was a great support from the town and uh, actually processing with the state that was very helpful. And so if Chris uh, Desjardins on the phone, I would say shout out to him. He did great work putting that together. And then also um, one bright spot too is that the Hopkins Athletic Fields project started uh, almost uh, three, four weeks ago, slated to be starting a seed in October. And um, if you haven't been out there to check it out, it's pretty cool uh, to see that's been ongoing for over a decade, just putting that project together. And uh, it should be, um, there, the fields won't actually be ready, but it'll be a new softball field, baseball field, and multi-use soccer field. And just given the seeding timeline, it won't be ready for use uh, this season, but potentially next season or next year, I should say. Uh, and it's going to have an irrigation system in it, so it's going to be pretty cool. That's great, Paul. Yeah. Well, congratulations on those. Those are a lot of, lot of people involved. A lot of generous, generous donors, and we will plan. Uh, some sort of celebration uh, when we get through all this and figure out what's going on with school. Silver lining, certainly, that we um, have the fields um, being worked on while we're not there. Thank you for leading that. I do have a question about the uh, computer investment that we're making. Um, and 
gosh, I, I, I think I am, uh, I, I revisit this often, just how thankful I am that the town supported our investment in one-to-one -one laptops for this time um, that has really helped us uh, with the pandemic and making sure that our students have what we need. I, I, my question specifically is about K through, I believe it's one. We had conscientiously chose not to have um, Chromebooks for them, but rather invest in a few iPads uh, per class year. And um, what do we need to do, if anything at all, to make sure that every student at that level has a Chromebook, and not only in this first six weeks, yeah. but in the event that we go remote later in yeah. the year? Yeah. So thank you, Gamera. That's a great question. It also will help me to clarify one thing. Chromebooks 3 through 12 for grade 2, uh, David Olson and the educators, I, I believe in grade 2 also, there was conversation uh, about the best kind of device. So it's a device that's a Chromebook 2-in-1 convertible. So that's grade 2. So it acts as kind of a Chromebook and, and a tablet. You can do both. Um, K1 is uh, we, we are, so we are we have many devices, we have the funds, students will be one-to-one. -one. The question will be what makes the most sense? So that, um, we have a lot of options, but I'm, we're, we're, we also have a lot of technology available. I don't think we've landed on which devices will make the most sense for K through one, and that is something that um, we absolutely wanna make sure we're having a conversation with the educators about. And not just the educators, we also want to work with our families. There were some families that preferred to use their own devices mm -hmm. just because we know mm -hmm. kindergartners might be a little rough and uh, people really didn't want to replace a school item and would rather just use their own. So we really need to work with the families too that are able to provide their own and want to. Um, and for those families that aren't able to, we'll be working with the educators in the first couple of weeks of school to really nail down what everybody would like to use, what we'd prefer to use. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, do we need to vote? Is this an action item on shifting those things into the next fiscal year? All just right. one more thing too, just on the field, just to note one thing I failed to mention that's a key aspect for the community is that there will be a partial uh, asphalt path around the outskirts of the field. I think it approximately two, two thirds of a mile. We do the second phase that'll complete it and there'll be a full loop, but that should be done as and available this fall for public use as well. So I, I'll make a motion, Heather, to support it, the movement to the capital uh, in the capital plan. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So it sounds like we do not have any articles for the special town meeting in October. That's my understanding. Great. Okay, good. All right. Uh, are there any, were there any other presentation or discussion items before we move into our closing public comment? Uh, nope. No, nope, we handled everything here. Okay. Um, before we move into closing public comment, uh, I'll just mention our next meeting dates again. We're going to meet August 24th uh, and again on August 31st. And we did discuss, uh, we will meet um, twice each month. Uh, and more frequently if we need to, but that, that is our commitment to continue to meet, um, chip away at some of our uh, normal business that we have uh, to take care of, as well as obviously attending to uh, the district reopening plan and review of the metrics. I know this is sort of like a wrap up of our regular business and we're about to convene into open meeting, but I may request at some point that um, we explore, as we ordinarily do, try to plan around our, uh, our crazy schedules, I may have to request a movement away from our Mondays. I don't know, Tara, if you two had a difficulty with Mondays at one point, but I know I'll, I'll be teaching a class at Stanford on um, removing racism from higher education. So. Mondays are gonna become a problem spot for me. So I'm just gonna plant that seed and ask um, that we might consider changing that. Uh, I would only uh, ask, I don't think that's a problem at all, just to remind the committee, because we certainly have our liaison from the select board, Jane Nevin Smith, and the select board typically meets on Wednesday. So that would be the only night that I would avoid as a school committee, um, but certainly uh, Tuesday or Thursday, um, we can uh, put out, I can put out a poll and get the best availability for folks. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Great, thank you. Thanks for that heads up, Kamara. All right, 
Uh, let's move then into our public comment uh, to close out for tonight. Again, um, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, uh, we have our policy around public comment. Please uh, raise your digital hand and I will call on you. Uh, we do have three minutes uh, per speaker, uh, if we can adhere to that. And I see we have uh, our first public comment, Emily Pfeiffer. Thanks. Hi. Um, first, on, I just wanted to say the last meeting, I really appreciated Paul's questions. I felt like they're the ones I would have asked if it was a Q&A. <laughs> so I was glad to have them put out there. It really helped um, to kind of educate us about what was going on. That was really helpful. Uh, the new metrics from the state with the shaded towns, are really rotten, I think, to release at the 11th hour. Um, and it's, as many have said, it's, it's really hard to apply it to our small community. I completely appreciate that we're trying to look at um, the entire county because it's kind of silly to look at our, our small, like the math doesn't even work when you look at the numbers we have in town. If I understand the math right, we would be red and white or, or red and unshaded at the same time if we had a case on a rolling basis within the previous two weeks, the way the math works out. So, um, so it's really confusing to try to apply it to our town. But in the three days since it came out, they already updated it. It's worse in most of the towns that are right around us. So I'm glad we have something to look at. And I'm so appreciative that we collectively in Hadley are looking at the change over time. I feel like there's a lot out there that's looking at snapshots that's just less relevant. So. Um, I just, I really appreciate that we're trying to use the metrics that are available to us. And I loved what Tara said earlier about not getting locked into exactly what the metrics should be today because they keep changing and there may be more things available later that might be more helpful. So I just, I really agreed with that. I appreciated it so much. And um, I know that there are a lot of people from a lot of towns who come into and through Hadley all the time and we don't have a magic bubble. And so even though we're unshaded right now. There's just no guarantee that we'll stay that way. So um, I'm glad we have something to watch. I'm glad we have something that indicates change. And I really appreciate how this group is looking at it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Are there any other uh, requesters for public comment? Nancy Sharp. Sorry about that. It took me a moment to scroll back because I was watching uh, the other person speaking. No worries. Nice um, to see you. I did have a few questions and I know Dr. McKenzie has been very thorough. I wondered about testing and even the possibility of rapid testing because what you see happening in larger areas than ours, um, that's almost a requirement. And I'm just wondering where we stand on that issue. And then my second question um, might go to Pam Haywood. Um, and Annie, in terms of our special ed population, so much of what they learn is from peers. And I know we don't have the ability to start with peers, but I'm just wondering what kind of model, like are these, I, I'd hate to see these kids in separate classes with separate teachers at the start of the year as well. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I think what we can do is fold that into our Q&A um, and clarifications as we move forward. So what I heard is uh, what our position is on testing, rapid testing, as well as yeah. um, with special populations as we go back into cohort um, in-person instruction and whether there would be any uh, peer um, integration within those classes. And what the model might look like. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other uh, Weinzik? Hi there, Becky Weinzik. Um, I apologize if you already addressed this. Um, I jumped in late, but for families who may not be able to make their children fully available for the synchronous learning time, especially at the elementary level, because the child care issues or whatever else, um, will there be flexibility or any type of accommodations around this? Thank you. Is that something some, that any of the administration would like to address now or would we like to move that to a q and I, 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 In general, we can move it to a q and There is a sentiment that I want to express to um, families. We, we recognize 
we recognize how challenging this is. We really do. I appreciate everybody. I know that different people have different views on how we should proceed. I will say that everybody, even when they've questioned or said, mm, that doesn't really make sense to me, people have always been supportive. So um, we want to find ways to work with families to make this meaningful and manageable. I think we can discuss details around that in a Q&A, but I certainly don't want families at this point thinking, gosh, there's no way this is, assuming that something might not work for them, I would encourage a family to speak always directly with the principal and also, that's for me to be quiet apparently, and also to, um, to speak directly with the principal and um, to bring these questions again to Q and A, but I, I just want to say that overall that we and we're open to ideas about how we can work with families to make this experience something um, to make it as manageable as we can. And it it probably is the biggest question that we get asked is how how are we going to manage that? How are we going to manage this as a family? and we're supposed to be working and we have children at home. And so um, I, I appreciate the question and I, I really am gonna be working with my staff to see what we can do and how we can really make sure that we're reaching out to families and, and, and working with them. I don't think anybody wants to see this as, as difficult as we know it is. Um, we really want families to feel like they're supported and, and you can reach out to me. You're, once you get class assignments, you'll be able to reach out to the classroom teacher. So um, I, I appreciate the question because it gets asked quite, quite a bit. Thank you both. Thank you. And I know we've referenced Q&A. Um, as soon as we are con we've concluded our collective bargaining discussions with HEA, which we will go back into tonight um, after this meeting in executive session, we will, we've also held Monday in case we need that. Um, then we can move forward with announcing um, Q&A sessions that will be available for both, um, both uh, administrations in terms of there may be some very Hopkins specific questions as well as Hadley Elementary School specific questions. Those would be open forums that would have that um, format of being able to dialogue with, ask those questions, get responses, and not, not part of a, a school committee protocol. Are there any other uh, public comments for tonight? All right. And I'm just scrolling through to see if there are any phone attendees. I don't see any. Um, so with that, uh, then what I need from uh, one of the members is a motion to uh, adjourn from this meeting into, I'm looking for my exact wording here, excuse me, um, a motion to adjourn regular session, convene an executive session to conduct uh, collective bargaining sessions as an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and not reconvene an open session. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, we need a roll call vote for this. Uh, so going back to my squares here, Humera? Aye. Paul? Aye. Tara? Aye. Ethan? Aye. Heather? Aye. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate again uh, the public participation in these meetings. This has been very valuable and we look forward to continuing uh, to meet with everyone. I will now adjourn this meeting and enter into our executive session.